you very much for coming and thank you to the center for um, inviting me to speak. Let me see if I can do this. Um, I was just thinking when Richard was introducing me about how I came to study uh, prisoner reintegration in Vermont and um, it has everything to do with the Vermont story and ties back actually to Frank Bryan a little bit um, in the sense that you know, I was interested in criminal justice. I've been studying in prisons and they said well you should study these things uh, they have here called community justice centers and and I was like what is a community justice center and I had no idea what these creatures were um, and they became very important to this story and I'll tell you how, how and why. But community justice centers are, um, I don't know if they're uniquely Vermont, but they are certainly um, really an important component of the, the, way, the community approach to problems, social problems in particular, in this case, uh, returning prisoners. and. Um, and I uh, think that it shows what a little laboratory in sort of community experiments, um, this project will, I think, explain that to you and just as we go through. So, um, so first I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the Vermont reentry strategy and give you a little bit of context for that. I will talk a little bit about you know, what, what it's like to conduct research in Vermont um, and some of the findings. I'll just give you a tiny snapshot. It, um, if you have more questions afterwards, I can explain. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the new initiative. But um, the context is, as Richard said, we have two million people in the United States that are incarcerated. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about that, I mean, aside from the fact that criminologists for you know, decades kept watching this number go up and being really stunned by that um, because crime was going down actually, but also because of all the problems that were associated with uh, mass incarceration. 600, 700,000 people every year get released from prison back into communities. So 95% of people um, are eventually released. And most people don't realize that. They think there's a lot of people serving life sentences. There aren't. Um, and so the question is, what happens when they get out? And of course, we've made it very difficult for people um, when they get out um, to find housing, uh, employment. Uh, they often have untreated substance abuse or mental health uh, issues. And um, so, you know, not surprisingly, we have an incredibly high reoffending rate, right? Something like 68% uh, within five years reoffend. Um, so, um, in about the year 2000, um, the federal government realized that they had this problem with all these people coming back, um, you know, unemployable, uh, not how, you know, not houseable, if that's a word, um, and uh, that th something was going to need to be done about this. So they created some new initiatives and started focusing on what's called offender reentry. Um, and, which really talk is programs that are devoting resources to housing and substance abuse and things like that to help people reintegrate. Um, and so all states started doing this, um, and uh, you know there were there were a lot of federal dollars and that not as much as there were, but there were some. Um, the there have been many, many strategies. One of the interesting things about Vermont is that most departments of corrections, when they got this federal money, uh, just used it to bolster their prison staff, right? So they'd hire a reentry coordinator at the prison or something like that. Vermont uh, Department of Corrections actually funded the community justice centers to, in part, to do the reentry services. Um, so. The um, Vermont story is that they, oh, I'm going to move, I'll hold this because I, I have to pace. Um, uh, Vermont decided ultimately, they tried a different, few different models, but they decided to do something called Circles of Support and Accountability, which is the, the short name for that is COSAs. And uh, the, this was based in a, a model that came out of Canada, which was a very simple idea. And the idea was that when someone comes out of prison, um, if they're a high-risk offender and, that the, and they are at risk of reoffending because of, you know, it, we can talk about all the many different reasons, but in part because of these obstacles that we've put in their way, then um, 
what can we do to help them reintegrate? And one of the, the Canadian model is this idea of creating a circle of community volunteers around them that would help them transition back to the community. And Canada had such great success with it that they've incorporated it, institutionalized it into their, uh, the Canadian uh, services, uh, correctional services, and it, it's just part of their policy for high-risk offenders. So the interesting story about Vermont is that it was a uh, sort of bottom-up plan. And what I mean by that is uh, Department of Corrections said to the community justice centers, uh, you know, what should we do for reentry? You can develop these programs. They, some people, some community justice center directors went to Canada, decided to adopt this model, and then it, now it's state policy. Um, and Vermont's story is also interesting because of the fact that other places that have tried to institute uh, circles of support have had a much harder time. And the reason is because, the reason we've been so successful is because of the community justice infrastructure. And I say this because when I went to New Zealand and looked at their COSA program, it was much different. They were having a much harder time. Many of the states have had a hard time. Um, and the reason is that like corrections funds the COSA program, but they don't run it. And so what they've done is um, embolden the community to take charge of crime as a problem, basically. So they, the community justice centers in Vermont, there's 20 of them uh, that are operational, and 19 of them have circles of support and accountability. So you think about this tiny state with a prison population of about 1,700, uh, having 20 of these programs, right? And what they do is front end stuff, which is uh, diverting people away from prison by doing um, reparative boards. That's the most of what they do. And then also on the other end, after prison, reintegrating people. So, um, but it's done at the community level. They're mostly municip run by municipalities. And uh, people in the community just volunteer to hang out for a year, commit to once a week meetings with uh, someone who's a high risk or medium risk uh, offender of, any, of many different types of offenses. And um, uh, <laughs> um, do things with them like uh, troubleshoot some of their problems, help them think about employment, maybe even help them find employment drive them around to various meetings because Corrections has a lot of restrictions on driving um, when you get out, but the rural state, you gotta drive to work. Um, and uh, helping them buy groceries and things like that. So it, it's, it's not rocket science at all. It's a very simple sort of human model um, that I would argue hugely successful. And um, so let me tell you how it works. You have the, what's called the core member, which is the person that's coming out of prison, right? And then around them is this circle of volunteers, uh, the reentry coordinator or the circles coordinator, who is uh, the, uh, an employee of the community justice center that serves, sometimes serves formally on the COSA team, sometimes informally, but uh, definitely serves as sort of an ad hoc advisor, trainer, modeler of and coordinates all the you know, meetings and activities and things like that. And then you have Department of Corrections over here um, funding them, but also uh, you know, probation officers are sometimes pretty involved, sometimes not that involved, but are in the loop. Okay? So the, but the volunteers are the most important part. So I did, I don't know what year it was, 2013 I think, I did um, a qualitative evaluation for corrections and the Interesting thing about that was they wanted to know how the relationships work. Not so much whether they work, but like what is the nature of these relationships. So I um, interviewed volunteers and core members and um, coordinators and you know, looked for themes to see what they talked about. And it was, it was actually one of the most fun projects I ever did because it was uh, very powerful what people said. And uh, there's a few, there's a lot of findings, but a few key ones that I wanted to mention. One is that a lot of times if it's a serious and or violent offender, they've been inside for a long time, right? Sometimes 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And 
when they come out, they're ill-prepared to function in the natural world, right? Uh, one guy had said to me, like, I've been looking at beige walls for 20 years. And so we went to the grocery store, and just the colors and the signage, you know, he started to have a panic attack. And it always reminds me of that movie Shawshank Redemption, you know? But um, so, uh, you know, they're what's called institution, they're institutionalized, right? So what the COSA team does is help them uh, become deinstitutionalized. So how do they do that? One of the main ways that they do this is by just spending time with them and um, talking them through their problems. So, the, and they often feel very self-conscious in the community and feel like there's, you know, some sort of target on their back or, you know, so they, um, they just the fact that sort of ordinary citizens are spending time with them uh, is is hugely communicative of, of a certain ethos, I think, but also uh, functional and just sort of helping them navigate, like, how do you get a bus pass? Sometimes, you know, people are like, I've no, I didn't know what a cell phone was because they didn't have those when I went inside. How do I use a cell phone? How do, you know? So there were a lot of sort of ordinary daily life things that they needed help with, but also um, just just learning to be comfortable in the world, right? And it's just ordinary citizens that are volunteering to do this. The other thing that they do is, like, a lot of times they'll share a meal together, and I, I for all you COSA volunteer folks, I think that's one of the most important things that you can do is break bread with people, and it, it's, very, it's sort of an intimate, familial act, certainly something Dismas knows all about. Um, but that uh, it, it's... It, also in that sort of, and, and also in just regular meetings too, what it does is model what pro-social relationships are like. You ask, how was your week? Oh, my week was okay. How was your week? You know, those sorts of just ordinary relationships. And the other is, and maybe this is the most important thing, is that because it was volunteers and not paid staff, many of the core members would say, I can't believe they would spend their time with me. They would use their free time to hang out with me. Um, and because of that, I don't want to let them down. So there would, these mutual obligations would develop that are, you know, the, the stuff of any of our normal relationships, right? You have the sense of mutual obligation. So one of the uh, sort of key concepts in criminology over the last, 10 years or so, 15 years or so, has been this idea of desistance, which means really just stopping from committing crimes. And the research has been really focused on, like, instead of looking at why people commit crimes, why don't we look at people who successfully stopped and look at what they had in common? And what they found was, overwhelmingly, they at least had one person who believed that they could be something other than a criminal, right? And that's one of the things that the COSA does, I think, most effectively. And when I would interview people, I was really struck by um, how they would say, you know, the volunteers would say, okay, yes, I knew you did these things, but, but you're more than that. What else are you? You know, did you used to like to fish? Did you used to like to hike? You know, what are the other things about you that we can focus on and develop? And um, the research shows very clearly that, that that's being able to construct a narrative about yourself that's other than a criminal one um, is key to being able to stop uh, offending. Um, so my argument is that instead of saying, you know, that we tend to think like you need to stop committing crime and then we'll let you reintegrate into the community, that instead you reintegrate them into the community and then they'll stop committing crime. So um, that we have to, you know, take a leap of faith and uh, go out on a limb a little bit. So the Quantitative research, uh, you know, I was presenting this research and people were saying, okay, this is all great, this sounds great, but does it work, right? And uh, um, Vermont is different because Vermont circles of support were the only place in the world that I know of, uh, and I'm pretty sure we're the only, I'm pretty sure I'm right about that, uh, that uses this for other than sex offenders. So uh, in Canada, it's a model that's just used for sex offenders in the UK, New Zealand, um, other places in the US, and Vermont uses it for any serious um, or high risk offender, and which actually follow, that is more in line with what the research would suggest is appropriate anyway. Um, 
And so let me just tell you what we did, uh, my, me and my colleague Robin Wilson and Megan Kerman. We, we couldn't do um, you know, a, a controlled trial, an experiment. So what we had to do was a retrospective study. And we took um, 130 core members, people since 2006, through, up through um, early 2017, who had had um, a, I'm sorry, through 2015, and then we followed them all the way to 2017, um, who had had a COSA. And then we created a match sample, one-to-one -one match, so that if it was a 25-year-old sex offender with um, a risk score of 30, we would match one, him with someone just exactly like that that hadn't had a COSA. And then we did a, then we, you know, did this painstaking process that took years going through to figure out if they reoffended, when they reoffended, and uh, what kind of reoffense. So the bottom line is that um, if you compare the ones that had a COSA versus the ones that didn't have a COSA, 45% um, were reconvicted that had a COSA, 56% without. Um, and uh, it was most significant if you look on felonies. So the felony um, significance was less than 0.01. Um, and misdemeanors, it was not significant. So what that means is there was no less likelihood that a person with a COSA would, um, they, they would commit misdemeanors at the same rate, sorry, but they committed far fewer felonies, which is really the stuff we we're concerned about anyway, right? Um, misdemeanors are, are not um, what really frightens people the most. So let me just show you this. I hope this is legible. Um, well, I broke it down by sex offenders, violent offenders, and general offenders. So there, there obviously can be overlap between those, but anyone who had any sexual offense was categorized as a sexual offender. Anybody who had any violent offense but not a sex offense was categorized as a violent offender. And then general offenders were everyone else, which was almost always some sort of drug offense. Um, you know, or burglaries related to drug offenses. And um, what you can see is that uh, there was significant differences with all the categories, and, um, but it seems to work a little less well for general offenders. And um, the reason these data are important is because no one else has used this model on other kinds of offenders other than sex offenders except Vermont. And so therefore we're the only ones that have these data and a lot of people are interested because they want to know is this a model that only works with sex offenders um, and, or, or not. And the answer is no, it, it does make a difference for every type of offender but it does seem to work better for sex offenders. Um, so so, and I can answer any questions about that, but let me tell you what I think the, the punchline is related to the Vermont story. Um, one is that uh, the, the Department of Justice um, did a, a study of all the COSA programs in the United States, which there aren't that many, and said that Vermont had the best programs. They had the highest fidelity, and what that means is they stuck most closely to what the model was supposed to be about. And, and the reason, and, and people come from all over actually to Vermont um, to learn about the way they set this program up. And I sort of take it for granted, and then when I go to conferences, people will say things like, I can't believe you have these things, you know, these COSAs, I can't believe your Department of Corrections does these things. And, or sometimes they're very dismissive and say, oh, that's Vermont, you know, it's like, um, so, you know, which I'll talk about that in a minute too. But I think the community justice infrastructure, the fact that we have this municipal level of um, community justice where they're dealing with sort of small and large problems or small and large risks to communities, uh, around community safety and involving ordinary citizens. I think that's very unusual, and I think it is a big reason why it's successful. And, and what I'll say when you're thinking like, well, what's the alternative? Um, in a lot of places, the Department of Corrections runs the COSA programs. And um, 
<laughs> a lot of people are nodding their head thinking like, ooh. Yeah, you know, it, it doesn't work all that well because all the reasons you can imagine, departments of corrections sort of default to um, a more punitive control oriented model, right? Um, and they, you know, in terms of like engaging communities, it's just not, it's not what they do. Um, the other thing about Vermont that is unusual is that they, because there's a population of 1,700 prisoners, and uh, you know it's a state that's a, really the size of a city. Um, they try all kinds of little experiments um, and do these innovative things that other places don't do. Um, it's kind of like you can you can turn a small boat easier than you can steer a large yacht, right? And we're a small boat, so it, it's. Um, you know, it, it, you can make change sort of quickly, you can try different innovations that are, um, you know, it's a, it's a good little laboratory. The other thing is Vermont, a lot of states have this, but Vermont was one of the earliest, if not the earliest, that had restorative justice in the statutes. So the, the COSA model is based on an adaptation of restorative justice. And restorative justice is the idea of restoring all parties harmed, including offenders, right? Um, and there's a lot of debate about that model, but the COSA um, motto is uh, no more victims and no one is disposable. And, and those are twin concepts that if you treat people as if they're, that no one is disposable, including even you know, offenders who have done heinous things, uh, then you will reduce victimization. And I think the research does bear that out. The other thing is the Department of Corrections in Vermont is the only Department of Corrections in the United States, as far as I'm aware, that has a restorative justice unit. Um, and so part, they have a small division of a few people, I think it's maybe five people now, that uh, do restorative justice. So they, they're the ones that interface with the community justice um, center. So it really is the state sort of devolving a little bit of its, um, well, you could say responsibility, but uh, you know, their control uh, down to the community level. And that's uh, pretty unique, I think. Um, so doing research in Vermont, I came from California before, um, and uh, you know I never tried to do research with their Department of Corrections, and I and I don't think I would. But even comparing to friends of mine that would try to do research in New York State or something, um, doing research in Vermont, the good news is the scale. So you know you can actually pick up the phone and call up the Commissioner of Corrections because it's such a tiny place, right? Um, you can uh, meet with people that you need to meet with. You can ask someone if they can produce the data for you that you need. Um, and it, the, you know, there aren't the levels of gatekeepers or the layers of gatekeepers that there would be in large states. Um, and the bad news is the scale. <laughs> so um, what that means is a lot of times we don't have the data. Um, you know, they had one guy at the Department of Corrections that was their data guy. And uh, when he retired, he didn't get replaced. So it's like, you know, one person can be incredibly instrumental, and when they're gone, they're gone, you know? Um, the other thing is that, you know, if you apply for grants, sometimes they'll say, well, you know, I'd love to see what interesting little weird thing you do in Vermont there, but it's not uh, applicable to anything else because Vermont is like, there's always an asterisk by Vermont, right? Like, um, because of the size and because we're outliers in all kinds of wonderful ways, right? But um, it's, you know, y you, whatever we might find in Vermont, people can say, well, that would not apply in X, you know, in New York or wherever you want to say. So. Um, uh, the, yeah, I guess that's, is there anything else I want to say about doing research in Vermont? That's it, I guess. Um, let me tell you a little bit about my uh, new initiative, and I know these are kind of three uh, disparate topics, but um, we have, uh, I've been doing research in the prisons for a long time. I've been bringing my students in the prisons for a long time. We partner with corrections to do um, 
some service learning projects for them, asking them what research they want done. So my students go inside and interview uh, people in prison, um, and we've created reports for Department of Corrections, one of which they actually submitted to the legislature as testimony. Um, and uh, through that process, I've become really interested in you know, all the various things that would help people succeed when they get out. Because even though Vermont prisons are more rehabilitative than many, many systems, um, anybody who's been inside knows that, uh, it, you know, it's, it's not an ideal situation. They could be, it'd be lovely if they were doing a lot more. Um, one of the things that is demonstrated as, as the, what somebody from New York Corrections said the other day was the silver bullet is higher education. Um, and the um, National Institute on Justice said education is the single most rehabilitative tool, uh, most important rehabilitative tool. And th there's different estimates, but some say that if you, if for every dollar spent, you get two dollars in benefit um, from investing in higher education. So I have been trying. <laughs> excuse me, for a few years to get a program off the ground, and we just started one at UVM called uh, LAP, which is Liberal Arts in Prison Program, UVM LAP, and we became part of the Bard Prison Initiative Consortium for the Liberal Arts in Prison. And uh, it next, I, I taught a pilot course this semester, which was um, just eight weeks, it wasn't like a full course, um, where my students were going inside and taking a class alongside the women at uh, the Chittenden facility. And then next spring, we're going to be teaching two classes that will be four credit, full 15 week. Um, and uh, we're working on lots of ways to fundraise those credits. But um, the, uh, there's, you know, the argument that seems to work best for people is to talk about the, the public safety benefit by reducing recidivism. And BARD's program has a 2% reoffense rate. 2% of people reoffend that, that go through their program, which is unheard of. Um, and the other programs that look at, that are uh, studies that measure uh, reoffending with people who have been through some kind of higher ed program, put it at like 13% or 14% versus the 50 to 67%, depending on how you count it and whether you're looking at three years or five years or, you know. Um, and, but the other thing that Bard has found is that people uh, report this feeling of, of hopefulness and confidence that they can do things and if, you know, that they didn't think they could do, that other people, uh, you know, I think the, the, if you go inside to teach someone, you're communicating to them that they are worth spending time with. And that that is probably one of the most valuable things. I think it's one of the most valuable things about the COSA program. I think it's one of the most valuable uh, things about uh, higher ed also. So, um, and, and I'm, I've come to believe through my interactions with Bard that uh, focusing on the liberal arts, maybe reading classic texts, maybe thinking about things that are bigger than themselves, bigger than the prison, um, reading poetry, and then developing the confidence that they actually have something to say uh, and can communicate in these particular ways about those things, um, that that has intrinsic value. Um, and so the research shows that even if it isn't higher education to get a degree that leads to a job, um, that it regard if you take employment out of it, it's still just participating in higher education uh, reduces reoffending. Uh, re so that is our next, the next phase, and then we'll be doing research on Vermont to assess the outcomes of that program. So thank you. And I'm sorry, that text is white. I didn't mean for it to be like that. Question? Sorry, uh, yes. Um. Dr. Fox, one question. What I keep hearing, especially the, around the women's prison, is um, given the fact that something like 40% of the, the women in there either have not yet seen a judge or can't be released because they have no place to go, mm -hmm. at a cost of $90,000 per woman per year, is there not 
a better way for Vermont to invest that money in terms of reentry? Um, well, if you're asking my opinion, uh, based on <laughs> based on the research, uh, you could you could educate them in the community for probably half that cost. I mean, it, you know, education is expensive, right? Higher education is expensive for everyone. Um, but if you kept them in the community and had, you know, sentenced them to college, um, you could save money and I'm, I can almost guarantee you, you would have better results, right? But I think there's a political problem, uh, which is that, you know, sometimes people don't, they resist the idea of someone getting Educate, you know, you do something wrong and you get education for your punishment. So I think that that's something we need to do a lot of public education around, I think, about why it's in people's interest to support this, which I believe it is. So, uh, yes, Alan. Can you break down any of your numbers further by <coughs> gender, by race, mm. anything like that? Or have you um, we, so not big enough? The numbers are not really big enough. We, um, the 21 of the 130 in each group were women. So it, it's small. I mean, I, I can do some analysis on it. We haven't done it yet. And race was not, there was, it was such a small number of people that were people of color that it wasn't in our sample. So, you know, we started with a larger sample. Vermont's done about, I think, maybe 250 COSAs total, but we had to eliminate some that we couldn't find a match for. So, they, you know, that may be uh, in, it, maybe more people of color in, are in that category or, you know, um, because we didn't try to match by race, but we did indicate race. So, um, the, uh, uh, so no is the answer to that. But um, maybe over time, as the numbers get bigger, we'll be able to do that. Yeah? Have you assessed the ability to read prisoners? Um, I, you mean for the higher education thing? I think that the the sort of uh, conventional wisdom in corrections is that if you're writing a document, it should be aimed at a sixth grade level. Um, and I would say from my pilot, there were some women that were very good writers and readers. Uh, the women tend to be more highly educated. They, more of them have completed a high school d degree than the men. Uh, Vermont has a higher educated prison population than the rest of the country by a pretty good margin. I don't have, I have no idea why. Um, but the reading levels, I mean, a lot of people have been ill served by their educational system, even if they graduated. So, um, and uh, so yeah, the, some of the, some people are definitely not literate. So in terms of the higher ed piece, we, um, you know, we we are going to start with people who have GEDs or high school diplomas, but also work with the Community High School of Vermont, hopefully, to help us assess who's college ready. And that may require some remedial education, especially because some people have just been out of school for a long time. So um, we're still in the process of working out all those details. But so, yeah. Um, on the support of women in particular, but I suppose also yet yeah, men. Families and children, have you done any research on the effect on, of this improvement uh, on the children of the prisoners? Um, in terms of educate, what education does in terms of that? If they're more successful if they, um, in returning to the family. Yes, in terms of education. Yeah, I have personally not because this is a brand new area. I haven't done anything on higher ed um, in prison. Um, but the research does show that um, that, well, it shows a lot of different things that are very, um, that intersect in ways that's kind of hard to tease out, but things like uh, remaining involved with your child, for example, helps, I mean, throughout the process helps uh, reduce reoffending. Um, if you are involved in something like education or any sort of, um, you know, rehabilitation program that would help you not reoffend, you will have a better chance of parenting when you get out. I mean, so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of factors that go both directions. So, um. yeah. You'd said something about uh, the average volunteer. Uh, mm. Did you find out anything about the volunteers? Is well, there something unique? I know 50% of Vermont adults, <coughs> according to some polls, are 
volunteers in their communities. But there must be something special about these folks. Yeah, I, um, I couldn't get a sense of that. Uh, so I'll tell you what my impressions are, and then maybe some of the community <laughs> justice folks here that are here could speak to this. But um, I found that it was largely, um, I mean, most people were retired, right, um, that had the time to volunteer. Um, the, it seemed to be kind of at opposite ends, either really young people or much older people. Um, and uh, they, for the most part, were, uh, some people were from the faith community um, and saw it as part of their mission. Uh, and, but a lot of people were just good old liberals that thought, um, that, that were critical of the criminal justice system and sort of felt um, that, that it shouldn't be as punitive as it is. Um, you know, but it really struck me, like I thought, well, you know, you could go to the Humane Society and walk dogs, or you could spend a year with, you know, someone who was a high-risk sex offender. You know, what, what is it that would make someone do that? And when I asked people, they would, first of all, if, you did, if they did one COSA, they would sign up for another one because they found it so rewarding. And when I asked them why, they would say, what other volunteer opportunity do you have where you can actually change the direction of someone's life? And I thought, well, yeah, that's true, right? So they, they really were invested in that. Um, the other thing is that I think, and you community justice folks can tell me if I'm wrong about this, but I think that what the, uh, you know, they get people in volunteering on the reparative boards, which are sort of petty things, shoplifting, uh, you know, um, and, and get them involved that way, and then, then recruit them for the, for the major leagues, right, mm -hmm. to, uh, to the circles of support. So I think once they kind of, you know, understand the community justice ethos and model, and if they're really into it and see the value of it, then they're ready to expand into to other things. Yep. Um, this is just slightly off topic of your of your talk, but I just wanted to see if you have an opinion on it. Um, <clears throat> Vermont and some other states uh, ship a proportion of their prisoners out of state to private prisons that are long distances from the home state. And I'm wondering, I, I know it's not part of your research, but I'm wondering if in terms of recidivism, that idea of being separated from, from family support and, and, and you know, kids and significant others and making that very expensive in terms of visiting would, um, would increase recidivism. Well, it should, and if you look at the data in the sense that, um, that the, thing, the key factors that reduce recidivism I mean, we th tend to think of it as these tangible, uh, sort of stabilizing things like a job and a house, and you know, and those are necessary but not sufficient, in the sense that I mean, you can be okay with just those. But the the key thing that really is what you know the the hook for really turning someone around and their ability to sustain that is, you know, the things that you get from a COSA, which is. Uh, someone believing in you, and that's usually in the form of family support. So COSOs tend to be, uh, people who get COSOs tend to be people who don't have a lot of family support, they're isolated. The research shows overwhelmingly that if someone is isolated, they're more likely to reoffend um, for a whole bunch of re reasons that you can just easily imagine. So, uh, the, and there's also on the other side is there's a lot of research that shows that if you can maintain family connection and family support, that will, you know, all other things being equal, that will reduce your likelihood of reoffending. So, yes, I mean, both sides of that, yeah. yeah. You had mentioned that Vermont is unique in that they um, are using these COSAs for criminals other than just sex offenders. Yeah. I'm curious to hear why it's been more traditionally used COSAs for sex offenders and why Vermont departed yeah. from that and chose to expand the program. Well, the, the the story of the way it evolved in Canada was that there was a high-risk um, sex offender who was about to be released to the community because he had maxed out his sentence, 
and um, the community was in ar up in arms and, and the media were going crazy and uh, there was a Mennonite pastor that said, we'll take him and we'll create, a, you know, sort of a force field around him, you know, and they created this circle of support and th then the community calmed down. So it was really about, partly about that and also just trying to sort of help this person as part of their, their um, religious mission. And then th it worked, it was really successful, and people started calling this minister all the time and saying, will you do another one, will you do another one, will you do, you know, and then they expanded and it became a program and it became institutionalized and then Correctional Services of Canada, you know, institutionalized it, right? So it, it was only sort of an accident that it was a sex offender, but it, that that is what the public is the most upset about and most alarmed about, first of all, and second of all, they often tend to be the most isolated. So, and the research on sex offenders shows that isolation is particularly um, a problem for them. So, and, and they're more ostracized and stigmatized. So it wouldn't, there's nothing magic, I don't think, about you know, the model in terms of sex offenders. That's just the way, so now it gets talked about as a sex offender you know, reintegration model or uh, recidivism reduction model, but it, it really is just sort of the happenstance in that way. Um, Vermont wanted to try it out, but thought it'd be sort of easier publicly if they tried it with something other than sex offenders, because there still is some, um, you know, sometimes people are, are push back against the idea that, that ordinary citizens would be um, socializing and spending time with a high, you know, a high risk sex offender. And so <clears throat> uh, some people find it more palatable, you know, some other kind of offender. But. Yes? Sort of uh, the flip side of that question, do you have any explanation or thoughts as to why it the COSA seem to be less successful on the <coughs> less serious offenses? Yeah, I do. Um, I, and I, but I, I, this is speculative. So when I was looking through the offense histories of, I, I got all de-identified data from corrections, just so I didn't know who any of the people were, but I knew that, you know, COSA number one, you know, had this many. Um, when I would look at the people who were general offenders, their list of offenses and reoffenses and criminal history was long, and um, and it was usually drugs, and then maybe there was a domestic assault, and maybe there was a burglary, and there was an assault on a police officer, and, you know. So you look, you could sort of look at it and think, wow, their their lives are chaotic, you know. Um, whereas some of the other people, you know, maybe. Um, their lives are not chaotic in most other ways, uh, but they do have this one offending pattern, you know, um, either a sexual offense or um, some kind of violence offense, but otherwise their lives might not be quite as chaotic. Um, it's what they always say in, in criminal justice circles is that sex offenders are pro-social, meaning that they can maintain jobs and do these things, but then there's this, sort of thing that they do over here. Um, and so I think that that's the main reason. It could also be that uh, sexual offenders have more people monitoring them more closely. So that, it, you know, one of the benefits of the COSA, the reason that I think that it works in part is that because the, the team is meeting with the person regularly, if it's usually a he, if he or she starts lying a little bit, acting a little funky, you know, something's not right, the team knows it, and then they can communicate with the probation officer. And so, um, you know, it, th that's why maybe they get sort of uh, more attention or more scrutiny after just doing a misdemeanor instead of something serious. You know, it's like sort of smaller offenses or, uh, you know, starting to act up a little more. And I, I don't, I couldn't say that for sure, but my speculation is that um, for sexual offenders, they have more scrutiny on them generally. So, um, you know, the, the slightest slip up will be sort of reined back in. Um, that, that's my speculation, but yeah. Can you just give us a little bit clear idea of like, Oh, sure. Yeah, sure. 
Yeah, sure. Um, so um, a typical COSA varies by place. In Canada, they have like seven volunteers. Um, here it's three or four typically um, around the person. You commit for a year to um, once a week meetings. Uh, the ones that work best in my experience <coughs> are the ones where they're spending time outside of that as well. Maybe not every week, but you know, going to play basketball, go fishing, take them for coffee, that kind of thing. So that there's some, but they also are on the phone, you know, they have regular contact. Um, and they generally keep in very close contact with the reentry coordinator, who is the um, community justice employee. Um, what they talk about, um, it, it can vary. It can be like goal setting, and, you know, um, sort of like, well, why don't you apply for two jobs this week? Or, you know, um, and they try to sort of redirect them if he's getting focused on something that they think is not necessarily very healthy or pro-social. Um, and, uh, uh, and, you know, do things like help them, like they're usually under pretty strict supervision um, restrictions, so it's about how to help them stay within their conditions and not get in trouble, but also achieve some of the goals they want. So maybe it's s seeing their elderly father, you know, who lives in wherever, and they need a ride there. Um, so, um, it's a lot of that sort of practical stuff, but then also um, support, like sort of giving them baby steps and then celebrating the successes, you know? So it's a lot of positive reinforcement. So it kind of just depending on where they're at. Um, a lot of the COSAs continue past a year so that people continue to meet after um, because they d have developed relationships, you know? Yes. Did you notice any differences in your research based on age, you know, in COSA um, participants, core members? Uh, just like in uh, corrections or in criminal justice circles generally, people age out, right? So the older person is far lower risk um, than the younger person. So. Um, uh, Yes, um, but the average age of people who got a COSA was 30, and so it's people who are not, I mean, they're kind of in between, they're not super young, but they're, I consider that young, but, uh, um, but they're not old, you know, um, and by the time, uh, older people, a lot of times, they're, at the, they're done with their criminal career, you know, um, so yeah, it, younger ones reoffend more. Um, so, yeah. So these COSAs are involved around post-conviction criminals. Yes. I'm curious about your research into any uh, like court diversion programs um, and things like that, and whether or not maybe those have more success with these general offenders. Um, well, I, you know, I is there a coordination I, needed between the two programs to be the most successful? Or uh, well, uh, that's. I have not done any research on um, court diversion. Um, I would say that one of my um, issues with reentry in general is that if we didn't do all this mass incarceration, we wouldn't have these reentry problems. And so we sort of created a problem and then created a whole system to try to fix the problem. And maybe the answer is to try to figure out who really needs to be incarcerated and who doesn't. A lot of, I believe that a lot more people could be diverted. The research shows that, um, you know, something like 40% of people who are inside could be successfully um, maintained in the community, with, you know, with supervision, and so that would be something like diversion, you know. Um, so, and you know, Vermont, it, by the way, is not. There are other states that that are much worse about this than we are in terms of, you know, like we don't send people to prison for, um, you know, simple possession, really, um, and they do in a lot of places, a lot of places still. So. How do referrals work, and is there currently an unmet need? Um, uh, I know it's high risk offenders. Yeah, <coughs> it's well high and medium, so it can be kind of like maybe somebody isn't as high risk as someone else, but they have less support. So when you look at the totality of their circumstances, they 
are more in need. Um, the referrals come from caseworkers and or probation officers. So uh, sometimes the caseworkers and the probation officers will say, well, this person seems like a good candidate for a COSA because you know, he, he doesn't have any support and he's, you know, they've tried everything. He's been in and out a million times and nothing's worked. Might as well try this, you know, that kind of thing. Because um, I did research interviewing probation officers and caseworkers and a lot of times that's what they would say is that they kind of were like, well, let's try this. Um, and they generally thought pretty highly of the program. Um, but uh, the I th there, it, come, it ebbs and flows, right? So that sometimes I think they can't meet the demand and other times they have more capacity than, um, than demand. Um, and I think some of it depends on the referrals and how they, you know, whether they're coming. Um, and, um, but yeah, it comes from corrections. And then the Reentry coordinators will go and meet with the person and sometimes with a team, right, to, uh, to make sure that they, you know, sort of understand what the program is, that they're a good fit, you know, that they're signing on, but that they understand what they're signing on for, right? Because there, there's a lot of, uh, what I found from talking to core members is there was a lot of misinformation. They thought like, oh, I'm gonna get a free apartment. Um, and, you know, that wasn't true. So, that, you know, they wanted to make sure you, you understand you're signing on for a year-long commitment of meeting with these people and that we communicate with your probation officer. And um, so, you know, not everybody was up for that. So. Okay. Yep, sure. My pleasure.